another little girl, she lost her mom and her brother. And she said, why would my mom and my brother die? And I lived. another one said that a man was so upset with him that he took his seat, that he made him move. And when he made him move, he ended up being in the seat with the only survivor. Where if the man would have shut up and been humble and been selfless, he would have been in the seat and been the only one to survive. Then, 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 then I, and then I saw another story about a young man out of Chicago who they said was the number one college basketball player in the country. He was a senior getting ready to do something for this Chicago high school that no one had ever done before, which is win two championships. They said they had planned him to, to go number one, uh, to be the number one recruited uh, kid in, in all of um all of the United States, and the guy that recruited Michael Jordan was going to be his, his was going to be his, uh, his, his his agent. And he was arguing with his girlfriend and walking her to a bus stop one three days before their season opener as a senior, and he's arguing with his girlfriend over a baby that they had out of wedlock, over a baby that they'd had in high school, and she wouldn't let him see his son, and he was arguing with her on his way to the bus stop and got into a fight with somebody he bumped into, and the kid he bumped into pulled out a gun and shot him twice, and he died eight hours later. The number one basketball player, the number one high school basketball player, he died. They planned on him. They, 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 they sued the hospital for over $10 million because they projected that that's what he would have made his first year in the NBA. Wow. And yet this turkey that survived an airplane crash grew up to be a blackjack divorce healer. <laughs> but, but they blessed me. One story made me want to be greater and better. One story told me that this guy, even though he was 35 years old, he was divorced, raising his daughter. His daughter, maybe, maybe his daughter's daughter's daughter was going to be the one to cure cancer or cure AIDS or be the first woman president or come and do. It was his lineage had to survive. Something inside of him had to stay alive. Something inside of him said, I'm not ready for death yet. I'm going to continue. And yet something in this boy, in this teenage boy, who was the number one one recruited basketball player in the United States that God said, your time is up. His mom said he accomplished more in those four years of high school than any of her family has ever done before. She goes, I don't call it as a curse. It was a blessing that he was here for as long as he was. That's right. I said, wow. Bless me. Ble but it made me want to be more unselfish. I said, Lord, bless me so I can give more. Bless me so I can do more. I cried out on the altar. I said, Lord, all I want, all I want, the only reason that I want another building, the only reason that I want something bigger and something better is for the people. See? Mm -hmm. But you need me. I need you. We need to do it together. My desire is that we don't walk in selfishness, but rather we walk in servanthood. I want you to learn how to be a servant. A sir, another word for a servant is slave. I want you to be a slave to God. There's a part there where the Apostle Paul says, I was a slave to sin, but now I'm a slave to righteousness. Amen. That I have to. I don't have a choice. I have to. I have to. I have to. I have to show up in case it's my opportunity to pray. I have to show up in case it's my opportunity to lead. I have to show up in case it's my opportunity to preach. I have to show up in case the word is just for me. I have to show up because this is the day that God decides to give me my healing. I have to show up because this might be the day that I get my prophetic word. This is the day I have to show up. Another thing, you were so blessed. To have such a family so rooted in righteousness. When you got Grandpa over here, you got Bishop over here, you got Brother Alfonso and Sister Grace and Pastor Amy and Pastor Misty and Brother Adam and Sister Erica, you got you are so lucky to have such a big family, so willing to be sacrificial. Adam is here every week. Bishop is here. Have you know what took Bishop out? A torn thing in his knee where he couldn't even walk. And then he said, I gotta get back there. No matter what it takes, I gotta get back there. Frustrated and angry when people that were perfectly healthy that could come didn't come. Yeah. But isn't that like the story? Here's the guy with everything in front of him and he denies it and gets shot like a dog in front of his school and another one who has nothing going for him but survives an airplane crash. Same scenario that I would want to give more and can't and you can give more and don't. 
And I, I don't mean just give of money. You give of your time, give of your ability, give of your gift. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. I said, yeah, Lord, I get so nervous and stuff towards uh, the beginning of the month because if we don't pay on time, you know, they start emailing, they start calling, and they want to know why. They want to know why. They don't, they don't want to say, you know what, Pastor, I, I mean, maybe you're just struggling. Maybe something's going on. Maybe, you know, maybe they just didn't give this month. We're gonna, No, 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 they don't say nothing. They say, where's my money? And now, well, as they should, we're taking their, their building. They should ask for their money should be a blessing for us to pay it. I would love, you know what we're going to do when we collect this $20,000 over this next week? Is we're going to make sure that we never have to worry about our rent for the next 365 days. That when we go to get another building, when we go to move into, we say, here's first month, here's last month, and here's my deposit. And there's a little left over so that we can upgrade our sound system. And it's going to be thanks to the 100 people who gave $200. Hello? Amen. That's, I'm, I'm telling you, man. You don't know how much it's going to bless Brother Walter and Sister Julia every time they show up to church and they see their pulpit. I built that. I did that. He preached from that. Who knows what names are going to be behind here? <laughs> Who knows? Who knows what people are going to stand behind? Who knows what anointing is going to flow from this point of contact? And why? Why, why did he do it? Why, I don't know why he did it. You, you know why he did it? Because we needed a pulpit. That's right. That belonged to us. It belongs to you. 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 This is our pulpit. So if we have to preach outside in the street, God, God, at least we have a pulpit to preach from. Yeah. They can take our building. They can take these classrooms, they can take our restrooms, but they can't take our chairs because we own them. They can't take our pulpit because we own them. They can't take our piano because we own them. And even though it's small and inadequate, we own that piece of equipment. Yes, <laughs> this microphone that I preach from every week, I love it because it's gorgeous because I move so much, was donated. Come on. Somebody gave it. Yes, I don't know how I live without it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Galatians 15. 513. And it feels so good to give. It feels so good to give. You know, it feels so good to give. It feels so good to give. It feels so good to be unselfish. It's a, it just erases the guilt and the anger and the frustration because you can say, I'm a giver. And when you lay down on, on your the next to your bed and you begin to pray and your bills are stacking up and you don't have money, wouldn't it be nice to look up and say, But Lord, I gave it all to you. I didn't give it to, to the casino. I didn't give it to, to, to the car wash. I didn't give it to the lawnmower. I didn't give it to I didn't give it to new clothes, even though I need new clothes. I didn't give it, I gave it to you. Because now I and I expect my harvest. I was living in a little apartment over there in Westminster uh, last year, and I hated every minute of it. And I felt guilty because I thought I should enjoy it. I thought I should enjoy it. I couldn't pay for it. I couldn't pay for it. I couldn't pay for it. Finally, I said, we got to go. We got to go. I didn't like the neighbors. I didn't like the area. I didn't like anything. I didn't like anything about it. I saw more Westminster cops in that parking lot than I've ever saw in the last 10 years in Broomfield. <laughs> and I was only there for like four or five months. And God, I said, Lord, I, but Lord, you know, the church rent is paid. And now, now you bless us with the house. With a four bedroom, two bathroom, unfinished, full basement house, and I get up every morning and say, I hated that apartment. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Although before I moved into there, I had to live with Erica and her family, and my dad and his family, and they had to live with me and my family in a four bedroom, two bathroom, finished basement. That was tough, ladies and gentlemen. You want to be unselfish. Let your family move in with you. That'll, that'll really, I think that'll get you into heaven. It's like, you come to the front, you let your family in with you. Come, come on, get to the front, amen. So, let me, I'm almost done. 
Galatians 5, 13 through 26. You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. You are free. Come on. You know where Jesus is? He's in jail, man. And when I was in jail, man, every opportunity they let me go to church, I went. Even to, I even went to like uh, Catholic services and Baptist services and uh, whatever. So I had three services in a week, man, and there was only one that I agreed with, but I went to all of them because I just wanted to get out of my cell. But here we are, we're free, and God's given us the ability, and he says, don't use your freedom to indulge in sin. So if you, God's calling you to church, and he's only asking you to be here once a week, twice a week, every other week, that's pretty good. Yes. Amen. I'm telling you, man, this is a... Another lady came. She said, Pastor, I'm ready to work. I said, I'm going to put you to work. She said, well, we used to do women's on Monday at this church, and then we used to do you on Wednesday. And we, then we used to, she said they were busy five days a week. I said, wow, how'd they get you to do that? <clears throat> so use it for your sinful nature. But you're a slave. You're a servant to the Most High God. You are, you are submissive to who your pastor is. You are submissive to what your pastor is asking you of. You have to be there for me. <clears throat> Rather serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. The same one that keeps you from coming here is going to be the same one to kill you. I promise you. 90% of murders are committed by somebody you know. See? See, 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 Anybody ever get murdered, the first thing they do is interview who? Their family. If a little kid goes missing, who's the first person they interview? The mama and the daddy. Because it's biblical. <laughs> Okay, so, so I say, 16, so I say live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to sinful nature. Then they, in, then they are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual morality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Now, there are a few things that they mention in there that go on in this church every week. Selfish ambition, witchcraft, discord. Come on. Yeah. I need you. I need you. I need you. I don't know. God needs you. God needs you. How can he ever send us out to battle if we don't have an army? Now, don't get me wrong. I'd be David all day. I'll go face the giant all day. I will go by myself. I'm a warrior. I'm a killer. I'm a prayer warrior. I'm a reader. I told my daughter the other day, you know why I'm learning? Why my spelling is getting better and better? Because I'm a reader. And the more you read, the better you spell. I told her, you know what? You're going to not spell so good because you don't read as much as you used to. But tell me you right. <laughs> right? Right? So I can go out and I face my giant all day. But God is not looking for uh, a one man. He is looking for an army of men. God is not. This is all a one-man show. This is a many-membered body. But if you send me out to battle without the arm, how do you expect me to win? Okay, let me, let me, this should play something real beautiful because let me, let me talk to you. I had two prophetic dreams over the last 48 hours. I've been dealing with insomnia for the last five days. Five days. I haven't slept right in five days. I've been going to bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning, and then waking up again at 11. And just been, God, what are you doing? This is so, you're so cruel and mean. All I want to do is fall out of the so for the last two days, I've had two dreams. I'm expecting a third either tonight or sometime this week before the revival. So the first prophetic dream that I had is I was in a house, 
And the people invited me into the house and said, we want us to let you sleep here on the mattress.